Hello, and welcome to Out and Equals 2016 Virtual Summit Series. Today will be the final segment in our Virtual Summit Series, the Walt Disney Company Case Study. My name is Daniel Lawrence Smith, Associate Director of Training here at Out and Equal. A reminder that this is a broadcast audio call, and the call will be 75 minutes long, and it will be recorded as a digital archive after the session. Please join us online at www.readytalk.com and use access code 694-6521. A few announcements here at Out and Equal. Next week will be our executive forum at the Palace Hotel here in San Francisco on March 22nd through 24th. That then culminates on March 24th with Momentum, Out and Equal's annual leadership gala at the Palace Hotel here in San Francisco. March 31st will be our monthly town call, Go Global, adapting your employee resource group to accommodate growth and success. On April 27th, we will have our global webinar series on Eastern Europe, hosted by Ches Wallach, our Fulbright Scholar on Global Initiatives. Our monthly town call on April 28th will be on unconscious bias in the workplace. In May, we will have our three-part Train the Trainer series for those of you interested in becoming out and equal certified trainers on May 3rd, 10th, and 17th. And on October 4th through 7th will be our 2016 Out and Equal Workplace Summit at the Swan and Dolphin at Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando, Florida. Please note that our leadership seminars will be on Tuesday, October 4th. With that, I would now like to welcome Rachel Rubin, Chief Development Officer at Out and Equal, to talk about our strong and collaborative partner with the Walt Disney World, with the Walt Disney Company. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for joining us. We're um, really delighted to be in conversation with so many fantastic companies about how to create stronger partnerships uh, that, that involve more dynamic uh, relationships. We've been partnering with the Walt Disney Company for over a decade, and we have a 360-degree partnership. And for us, that means it uh, kind of goes beyond writing a check. So uh, we have the financial support of the Walt Disney Company, which we are incredibly grateful for. We also act in uh, co-advisory capacities. So uh, the president of Walt Disney World Resort, George Calagridis, sits on our board of directors. And then we're able to involve uh, different people throughout their organization in connection to ours. So Bernie Zank, who you'll hear um, on this call in a little bit, is facilitating one of our executive forum classes. Rod and I are in uh, really regular conversation uh, as things come up at Disney and they have a quick question uh, in a consultative way uh, that where we can help on LGBT diversity and inclusion, we're able to chime in. And the same thing happens when we're thinking about you know, how to best shape something for a corporation, we can reach out to them. So we really have a collaborative 360-degree uh, relationship. What it feels like is that workplace equality is really important to us, and it's really important to the Walt Disney Company, and we both work together to, to watch that come to life. Great. Thank you, Rachel. And with that, we'd now like to turn the floor over to Bernie Zank. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, uh, my name is Bernie, and I work here at Disney. I've been back with the company for about two and a half years, and I work in a part of the organization called Disney Institute. And for those of you not familiar with what that is or who we are, we're the external version of Disney University, which is the, uh, Disney University is the internal training for our cast members, which is uh, how we refer to our employees. And so within the Disney Institute, we train others, outside individuals and organizations, on uh, Disney's approach to leadership, employee engagement, quality service, all under the umbrella of customer service. And uh, as you'll hear through the conversation in the next hour or so, part of the aspect of the Veterans Institute came from a partnership and marriage between what we do naturally and organically through the Disney Institute uh, and the rest of the company with Out and Equal. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm based in Orlando. I grew up in Northern California and stepped outside of the company where I started my career for about five years and got into business education. Pleasure to be here. Great. And Rob, would you also like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Rod Wingfield, Director, Global Diversity and Inclusion at the Walt Disney Company. 
I'll get into a little bit more of what uh, specifically that means in relation to our work and my work uh, later on uh, on this webinar. Um, but uh, suffice to say for now, I'm, I'm pleased to be on the call and thrilled to be presenting with Rachel and Bernie. And thank you, Daniel, for uh, moderating. Well, thank you all for your time and participation. We're so happy to have you on the line with us today. And with that, let's go ahead and show a brief video with some of the highlights from the Equality Institute. You know, when we started this, our goal was between 200 to 250 attendees would be success. 250 would be blowing it out of the water. We're happy to say we have over 550 in attendance with over 300 different companies represented. The Equality Institute was for the purpose of introducing people who may not have the option to go to the big summits in different places in the country to bring it closer to home to some of the southern states and some of the medium-sized companies. The goal for today was really to expose people to the best practices of Disney and the Institute and the work they've been doing, as well as benchmarking other companies that have great practices going on. I think it's great for organizations that are smaller to get exposed to some of the great strategies that are here, but then for those bigger organizations to come get revitalized as they go down their path for looking at LGBTQ equality and really get their people excited about the work that's been done and also work that still needs to happen. By letting our employees know that we promote an inclusive and respectful workplace where you can bring your authentic self to work, it's critical to making sure our culture stays vibrant and our employees stay productive. It's really been a partnership and collaboration with Out and Equal, and it's been absolutely fantastic. We've learned a lot along this journey. It's amazing to see people like George get on stage and welcome so many different companies to this event. To see the diversity of attendees has been phenomenal. While I teach diversity and inclusion, there's always so many great things, especially seeing the Disney Institute friends talk about their approach to communication styles, leadership, inclusivity, and caring. And I think those are some great things that I'll walk away with today. I'm hoping that people left today with the idea that I matter and that what I do matters. And they come away with one clear objective for how they can make a difference in their workplace. I'm coming away with new ideas, new things I can take back to my organization, and then a whole group of new friends that I can network with and stay in relationship with as we go forward. So just some of the highlights there from the Equality Institute. And with that, I will now turn it over to Rod to talk about diversity at Disney. So I'll just give a, a little uh, description of my role, and then that will lead in set up this slide. So I work at the corporate headquarters for the Walt Disney Company, and I help lead programs and initiatives and build strategic frameworks around D&I um, that span the enterprise. So all of our segments, including Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, ESPN, the Walt Disney Studios, have their own DNI practitioners. My job is to look at the three primary areas of focus for us, which are workforce, workplace, and marketplace, against specific dimensions of diversity, such as LGBT, and come up with strategic frameworks, programs, and managed relationships um, associated with those. So that's how Rachel and Celise and all the wonderful folks at Out and Equal and I became so acquainted. In terms of these actual areas of focus, in terms of workforce, uh, we want a workforce that reflects our global customer, viewers, fans, and guests at every level. In terms of workplace, we want to make sure that it's inclusive and provides the opportunity for our people to contribute and develop their full potential. And then in terms of marketplace, we want to leverage that diversity to create content, products and services, and also guest experiences that grow our business and engage with diverse communities. So a lot of my work also focuses on outreach, um, and uh, that's a little bit of how we started the initial discussions uh, with Rachel on uh, this Equality Institute. Great, thank you so much, Rod. And now I'll pose a question uh, both to um, the Walt Disney Company uh, as well as to Out and Equal, Rachel, to tell us about how the concept for the Equality Institute came about. Uh, Rachel, if it's all right with you, I'll jump in there. This is Bernie, and uh, I, I guess to, to back up a little bit, going back over a year ago at the Executive Forum, I had been with, back with the Disney Company for a little bit less than a year, 
And really, it just began with a simple enough suggestion. Attend the executive forum, listen, and learn. And part of the executive forum's goal and objectives is to help uh, individuals that are uh, either executives or on the executive track or allies to identify what type of resources they have within their sphere of influence that they can leverage and make a positive contribution back at their organization uh, and in the communities that they, they live and work within. So that's what I did. I listened, I learned, and it was very educational and, and transformational for me. And I came away with, um, with the help of my colleagues in the group with one or two key themes that seemed to be reoccurring for the majority of attendees. And at the time, it was actually the post-ENDA conversation that was the most uh, hit conversation. And I took that back to Disney, and I started circulating that saying, could this be something that Disney had a story to talk about? And candidly, for those on, on the, um, the webinar, we found that the post-ENDA conversation, um, which is the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, was, a, was too political of a field that we didn't uh, feel we had a voice to say that we wanted to go directly into, given what our brand and mission was. What we were comfortable with was equality and making sure that our brand, which we knew to be very strong, might have something to say that would resonate with people across the country and the world. And so uh, as I circulated the idea among our corporate diversity, which was Rod's team, our local diversity here at Parks and Resorts, and also our content and design team, it sounded like we might have something. The next question we asked was, did we have a platform and a method to communicate uh, what it was? And we, and we thought our brand would help us do that. At, at Disney, we, we use the word synergy a lot. And what that basically means is the individual parts add up to more uh, than what their individual pieces would otherwise. And so the question was us is that did our synergy of all of our parts and our brand reach the audience and give us a method to do that? And, and Daniel, if you'll let me, I would love to get a little audience participation to reinforce um, why we think our brand might touch uh, most of the people on this call in one way or the other. Absolutely. And here is our first poll. So, Bernie, if you want to read out what the question is, uh, and then um, as, you, as you fill that out, go ahead and put your answers in and hit submit. So this is just, this is just a little fun to see uh, who has firsthand experience with a part of the Disney organization and, and where that might be. So if any of you have ever visited Disneyland Park in California, Walt Disney World Resort in Florida, Disneyland Paris, Hong Kong Disneyland Resort, Tokyo Disneyland Resort. Please go ahead and indicate that. Or Great. If you we have, have about 75% of the people who have responded so far. Um, over 50% having gone to Disneyland Park. Uh, over 80% having been to uh, Walt Disney World Resort. Um, and then about 4 to 5% for Disneyland Paris, Hong Kong Disneyland Resort and Tokyo Disneyland Resort, and about 8% of you who haven't yet been to a, a Disney park. About 8%. Huh. Daniel, can you get those names to us later? We'd like to follow up with them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one then. Still, so we've, we've touched the majority of people, but not everyone. So if you've ever attended one of Disney's Broadway shows, such as The Lion King, uh, maybe Aladdin, or The Newsies, go ahead and indicate yes, or, or no, or if you can't remember because it was so much fun, uh, you can mention not yet. Okay, and we see the results coming in in, in real time. Again, about 75% of you have responded so far. And what we see is over 60% have said yes, whereas about 40% have said uh, not yet. All right. I, I can see we're going to have to pull out the, uh, the big, all-inclusive one. So here, here's the next question. I, I'm hoping this, this uh, pushes everyone else over the edge. If you or someone in your family or a friend or maybe one of their children, a niece, a nephew, a cousin, or daughter, has seen the movie Frozen and you have firsthand been able to sing along or hear them sing along to the words, every single word, go ahead and tell us if that has uh, touched your life in any way.
And as those results are coming in, we're looking at about 85% saying yes, so the overwhelming majority. Got it. All right. Well, so thanks for playing along there, everyone. I appreciate that. The goal there was to, to reinforce our hypothesis was that Disney does have a strong brand and that it is our responsibility to be stewards and protectors of that brand and also at the same time to see if we have a message to – to share and to use that platform in partnership with Allen Equal, that might, that might help. And so the next question for us was, if we did have a message and we thought we had a platform, how do we go about securing company-wide corporate support? So I guess that's where I jump in. This is Rod. Um, so Bernie and I were at the same executive forum where the idea initially was pitched and birthed, and um, I think from a practitioner's point of view, what was great about uh, the idea and the timing was that we have clearly introduced um, and laid the groundwork for LGBT as a key diversity plank that aligns with our diversity strategies, that aligns with our company values and our brand attributes, attributes such that a lot of our organization was already poised to be receptive to an event like this. In fact, we've done other similar events in other areas, such as uh, the veterans space and uh, helping other companies and encouraging other companies to create their own veteran hiring programs based on some of the lessons learned. So what I experienced was actually uh, a very receptive audience at all levels within our company to the notion of doing the Equality Institute. And uh, we'll get into a little bit later some of the details around picking the location, et cetera. Great. And with that, let's now turn it back to Rachel to talk a little bit about the business case and the legal landscape behind moving the program forward. Sure, thanks. And, and this is really meant to, to level set uh, in case anybody on the call is not quite sure how we do this. So we talk a lot at Out and Equal that companies that do good do well. And so we're thrilled for this to come from an altruistic space, which, which it tends to from most of uh, our contacts that work in diversity and inclusion. But we know that at the end of the day, we need to make that, that bottom line business case to corporations that this is, this is going to be good for their business. So we level set and we talk about hostile work environments that 40% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people have experienced a hostile work environment in the U.S and 90% of transgender employees have experienced harassment, mistreatment, or discrimination on the job. We let people know that we've done a really in-depth analysis through our research institute of 36 studies and found that LGBT supportive policies and workplaces are linked uh, to greater job commitment, improved workplace relationships, increased job satisfaction, and improvement, improved health outcomes. So we're seeing that, that, that employees that are LGBT, that feel safe at work, that feel good about what their company is doing, are more productive employees. Daniel, can you, uh, can you go to the next slide? Great. Uh, this is a map, so, and, and it's always, you know, I, I kind of uh, think that people are, are not totally uh, sure about where we are with laws in this country right now. So we hear a lot about marriage equality passing, and that is fantastic, but there are still 31 states across the country that lack protections for LGBT workers. So that means that in those states, you can be legally married on Saturday and then legally fired on Monday for getting married on Saturday. So, you know, and when we talk to companies about what that means for them and their company and their employees is if you take a company that has really great diversity and inclusion policy and, and they have a non-discrimination policy and they're not going to fire anyone for being gay, but they have a partner and that person's partner doesn't work for such a great company and they're in a state where they don't have any protections and they're in a state like most states in our country where marriage uh, records are public documents. Marriage is not, not necessarily available to them. So we'd like to kind of remind companies of what's going on if they're in any of those states that you see on there that are red where, uh, where there are no protections. Uh, kind of keeping that in mind, level setting with them, letting them know that you know, we have marriage equality, we've made a lot of progress, but we're not done. We need your help moving things forward. You move to the next slide, thank you. So we look at the social and legal landscape. Uh, you know, as we, um, as we look at 
kind of as gay marriage and workplace protections are happening, as we are gaining momentum um, in, the, in the social space where LGBT is becoming kind of more and more people are coming out, it's part of more and more families, we're seeing a lot of progress and we're also seeing a lot of growth in LGBT consumer purchasing power. So this is a huge market um, when you look at how you want to do recruiting and uh, becoming an LGBT employer of choice in the midst of you know, a talent war in your industry. This is something we think you need to do. And then we look at the, the LGBT marketplace and, and how much um, is there in both B2B and B2C business. And then implications for employers. So of course there are legal compliance issues, there are benefits and tax issues, there are talent acquisition strategies. A lot of multi-layered um, parts of this business case that um, that they're already considering to see that yeah it's nice but also it's re it's really important and it's gonna your business is gonna be stronger when you have strong global diversity and inclusion policy. So out and equal, we are the world's premier nonprofit uh, leading LGBT workplace equality work, and we do that through partnering with companies on everything from kind of the the getting down to the ground on those legal benefits and taxation issues to helping out with talent recruitment strategies, to figuring out how to, how to bring these strategies global. In, with, with Disney Institute, we had a great chance to partner with the Walt Disney Company's kind of best practices in leadership, employee engagement, and customer service. Take our uh, experience in leading LGBT workplace equality work and mold those together. And just like Bernie said, kind of one plus one equals three when we put those, those, those two things together and, and had some really great synergy. Great. Thank you, Rachel. And you did spend some time talking about marriage equality in the United States and the fact that we can now be married in all 50 states. Uh, but while there are still uh, marriage protections, there are many, many states where you can be fired simply for being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And with that, on the theme of marriage, we do have another interactive poll. And what we're asking is, if you are in a relationship, how long have you been with your partner or spouse? And go ahead and answer and then hit submit with that. And again, we'll be able to see those results in real time. We have about half of you having responded so far. That's great, great. About 75% of you. And I don't know, Bernie, if you want to chime in, I do see about at least 6% of you saying 25 years plus. So that's amazing. Did you say approximately 6%? About 6% at 25 years plus. Yeah, about oh my gosh. individuals on the call. Congratulations. Wow. Um, so, Rod, you want, can we talk in real time? Uh, I, sure, I know everyone can hear, but... Uh, sure, absolutely. How, how is your supply of uh, Disney Plush over in Burbank? You know what? I think I just got a fresh order yesterday. Daniel, is there any way to identify offline who the 6% is and possibly offer to get in their hands uh, one of these to, to celebrate and recognize that? Absolutely. That's something that we can do. Um, congratulations, everyone. And again, just a, a little way that is uh, creating magic within Disney. And if we can do that to, to celebrate your success in the relationship, uh, we'd like to be a part of that. That's wonderful and so generous. Um, so now that we understand a little bit about the legal landscape, we took our interactive poll on marriage. The next question is, how did you ready yourselves to pitch this within Disney and what that process looked like? <laughs> um, yeah, so this is Bernie again. So you see on the slide, we're, we're saying the why. So I think we've articulated why we think it's important and the, the value there among ourselves and the initial folks that were on board with, with the idea. Uh, in all honesty, the, the how is where we got a lot of questions afterward about uh, what were the roadblocks, what were the successes, and what key learnings did you uh, care to pass on to anyone that wants to do something similar within their organization. So uh, without any kind of formal priority, let me tell you what I learned, the good, the bad, the ugly, and if it helps you uh, avoid some of that, I, I, then that, that's worth it. So first and foremost, I would suggest what, you, what we call deck, which is otherwise just a PowerPoint presentation. And here's the reason why. It puts something on paper and allows people to look at it, share it, talk about it. 
PowerPoint when it's uh, sent out via either electronically um, or in person tends to reduce the amount of text if, if you're uh, judicious about how much text you put on there versus an overall summary in Word you know, that's multiple pages long. So I suggest you start with that, and, and here's my biggest suggestion is for anyone that suffers from analysis paralysis, uh, push yourself past the comfort lay, uh, level, be courageous, and just get something out there. I'm not saying be unprofessional and sloppy, but if it's not baked, just put it out there. And here's why. What I found is that the messier it was, albeit still professional, the more people were willing to help because they had something to contribute. And in the end, they saw their contribution and their ideas in the next version of that deck. So it built momentum unintentionally, uh, and, and, I, and I welcome that. So that would be my first one. Um, and also, time is of the essence. If, if you wait too long, the opportunity to seize the moment might pass you by. I'd also suggest that you prepare yourself mentally for the amount of feedback that you will most likely receive. Not everyone in the organization, uh, candidly and transparently, probably thinks your idea is the best thing ever. Or even if they think the idea is great, it might mean more work for them, and they're not on board with that right now. So be prepared to have people give constructive feedback, most of it well-intentioned, every so often those that just really aren't interested for their own personal reasons. But the more you go in mentally prepared for that, the, the less of a, an emotional toll or strain it will take on you. The other suggestion I would have is, Whatever you can do to tie your idea or initiative back to the goals of the, the company that you're in so that it, it, it may be the vision, maybe the mission, common purpose, or values, whatever it is that you think is the common language and importance to the company, the stronger your case becomes because it's reinforcing what the senior leadership has already identified as important. And I'd say as part of that, <clears throat> return on investment is key. Now, you might not be able to generate, and most likely won't, a financial return on investment, and that's where going back to your values and your mission, maybe um, social entrepreneurship uh, is important, or a positive impact in your community. Going beyond just the strict um, bottom line is how you can overcome some initial hurdles and objections that you'll most likely uh, encounter. I, I would also say the other key thing I learned, and for many of you on this phone, this is probably common sense, but I'll say it in case some of you are more junior in your career. Communication and the method of communication that you elect to share your idea is absolutely critical in the infancy of your um, listening tour and your sharing tour. And but what I mean by that is if you can restrict yourself to no email, if at all possible, and instead uh, set up group meetings to share and to discuss and to solicit feedback in person, I found that invaluable. And the key for that was that if you send it out via email, I found that I sometimes lost control of the message and how people couched it to the next person they, they passed it on. And when that happened, I'd, I would oftentimes have to go back and retract. So my suggestion is to go slow, to go fast. Rod, do you have any Bernie, suggestions? Yeah, if I could just throw in there, because uh, in terms of kind of getting it approved and getting it through uh, all the, the layers, as you described, my, my work was slightly different. You were focused a lot on what would that content look like? What would the business case be? I was pitching this to stakeholders uh, across our corporate offices and with uh, other segments of the company, um, both to participate in either content development um, or even just to attend the event. Um, so we have LGBT employee resource groups at the company. We wanted to leverage that mindset in the curriculum development. Um, but really what this also forced us to do was to get uh, speedily handy at describing our company's history of support around LGBT. So everything from you know 10 years now uh, in a row, scoring 100% on the HRC Corporate Equality Index, our global non-discrimination policy that's inclusive of sexual orientation, gender identity, providing same-sex domestic partner.
the company. We had to be able to articulate that messaging because anytime you're going to go out and uh, with a partner company like Out and Equal and say, hey, we, the Walt Disney Company, think we have something to pass along. We've had some lessons learned and we think we have some best practices. You really need, first and foremost, to make sure that everyone inside your company understands what those are because that isn't necessarily something that you routinely publish or communicate. So you might be surprised at the amount of executives or other key stakeholders, whether it's from legal, marketing, creative, you really need to start with the basics when you start these conversations to get something like this approved. And then once you tell them what the value is, and as Bernie said, what the ROI is, and especially what I find is if you can throw a challenge to them about how they can participate and either solve a problem or add content to it, it kind of turns them into active engagers. And, uh, it, it, you know, we ended up having uh, very, very, very little in terms of, of actual um, uh, pushback about doing the event. Now, what you'll appreciate at a company like Disney, we did have a lot of, was a lot of opinions about how it looked creatively, every word that was on the page, the font size, and uh, Bernie and I, as well as Rachel, would have plenty of conversations along the way um, to, to, to kind of uh, uh, get ourselves through the process of those kind of layers. And uh, if you're doing a program like this at a company the size of Disney, um, or even if it's smaller, I bet you'll encounter a lot of opinions along the way. So be prepared for that. Uh, Rod, I couldn't agree with you more. And for those of you uh, that are, I, I see some of the comments that are coming through, and I, I love them. Thank you so much. This is this is great. Uh, two two things uh, based on what I'm seeing coming through. I suggest forming a partnership or core working team. So Rod was the value of having Rachel, Rod, myself, and a couple other key folks within Disney that really were committed to this vision and idea of the Equality Institute was that uh, we were we were able to use each other as sound boards and, and litmus tests saying, would this resonate or, or not? Uh, and I, here's what I would suggest. Be as, as uh, critical and intentional about creating that core group as you would about bringing in your next best new hire into your department or organization. They can either spell the success or lack of success uh, because that core group is really kind of your, your board of directors in the infancy, kind of an entrepreneurial thing. The other thing I would tell you is that uh, uh, Rod was joking and laughing when he said about all the feedback we got about fonts and this and that. We also encountered, at least I encountered, quite a few initial setbacks where I thought at multiple points in the process the initiative was going to be closed out and shelved. And uh, if I hadn't had the core working team uh, to rely on, I, I think that might have um, maybe uh, made me uh, less resilient, if you will. So if you go in there with the mindset that it's a team effort and that also you are going to have some rough days, but it's worth it for the right reasons, I, I found it to help uh, significantly. Just one more, two more comments I'll make about the, the groundwork that we laid. One particular item was even in the selection of where we were going to hold this first Equality Institute. And we very purposely selected Orlando, Florida. As you saw on the map, the heat map that Rachel shared earlier, the southern states are all red states. And we felt like we need to take that message um, to HR, business executives, and working professionals in areas that don't have protection to help them build their business case, even for policy changes within their company, um, which oftentimes are the places you kind of have to start first on this journey is considering what kind of policies you already have in place to protect your employees and to make them feel like it's an inclusive environment. So George Caligridis, the president of Walt Disney World, was very mindful to introduce the concept of the Equality Institute and the selection of the location amongst our diversity council uh, here in, um, Orla in Orlando, Florida. And diversity council is made up of various executives, uh, mostly at very senior levels within the company, but not exclusively, who comprise, com comprise a body of folks who help to lead and guide 
the strategic visioning around our diversity initiatives at the company. So George really wanted them to understand why we would be doing this event in a state where it might garner us some negative publicity or negative feedback. And everyone uh, by the end of that meeting was on board and supportive of doing this. And, um, and we really also have to thank Rachel and Out Equal for lending so much data to us um, that was used in the building of these business cases and these pitch decks that we would take around the company to help um, socialize the concept of Equality Institute and, and gather support. Wow, thank you both. It sounds like a lot of effort and insight was put into just bringing this program forward uh, on behalf of the Walt Disney Company. Rachel, I'm wondering uh, if at Out and Equal there were any early concerns about such a, a big project with an external partner uh, and how Out and Equal decides to devote resources to projects like this? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, we, it, we looked at, we have very limited resources. So it's, a, it's always a tough call because sometimes these are great projects because it helps our expand our reach with, with our very small staff of 20. We're able to do a lot more when we're in partnerships. And sometimes we have limited resources and this is of course our, our staff's time and all of that and so it, it has to be the right fit. Uh, and this just was, it kind of hit every marker we had. So what, a lot of it was, was mission centered, is that this was going to get the message of workplace equality out to, to more companies so that they would go be able to go back to their organizations and really, um, really invest in something that would be meaningful. Uh, like Rod said, we have a southern state strategy here at um, Out and Equal, so it's really important to us to be focusing as, as often as we can and prioritizing as often as we can in southern states. So that it was held in Florida was really critical um, and important to us. And then we have a really, as you've kind of heard throughout this, um, trusted relationship with Disney where we felt like, you know, these are, these are big projects, but we felt like we had the right partners in place to have honest conversations about um, intellectual property, honest conversations about logistics, um, all of that, and just making sure that we felt like we had long-term trusted partnership uh, with everybody at Disney, which, which we did, and, and, and it really went swimmingly both the events, which you've heard a little bit about, but also the process. Uh, once it got greenlit over there and greenlit over here, uh, everything went just so smoothly. That's great. Thank you. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the planning process and obviously the wonderful partnership between Out and Equal and the Walt Disney Company. And now let's actually talk about the Equality Institute itself. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So for those of you that weren't able to attend in person or just saw the, the brief video, uh, let me back up a little bit. This is Bernie and explain what our vision was and how we pitched the ideas and where that, where that idea came from. So th the great news is when, when I heard the themes that were important within Out and Equals Executive Forum, I had a model already in mind. It was a previous success that the uh, company, the Disney Company and Disney Institute had done called the Veterans Institute. And the Veterans Institute was all about taking the learnings that Disney had based on a commitment our CEO, uh, Bob Iger, had made a few years earlier about hiring returning veterans and taking those learnings and turning it back out to the wider population so that other organizations and companies could make as uh, easy and smooth a transition for the returning veterans to their organizations as well. So the great news is that Rod's team had already been working on that. Many members of the content team at Disney Institute had already been working on that internally. So we rebranded that format into the Equality Institute using out and equal as our content expert for the legal landscape and the overall uh, societal environment and the Disney Institute informed uh, using Disney's lens and information. Uh, as you can see on the slide, our, our three goals were inspiration, education, and celebration. And the way that, that played out in a one-day format was that the morning uh, in partnership with Out and Equal was really owned and chaired by the Out and Equal team. So they were responsible for obtaining experts within their sphere of influence to come talk to the participants about what is going on. So some of those slides you saw earlier today about where it's legal to still be uh, discriminated against, et cetera, they had kind of a state of the, the movement and the community uh, speech. They also had some of their board members and other individuals 
talk about their personal stories within their work environment, and that was extremely impactful. Many of the individuals that were participants at the Equality Institute were first time exposed to this topic in, in a formal situation. Allies that had heard that uh, this was going on and they wanted to be more uh, instrumental in helping out their colleagues that might be struggling through something at work or at home. So Allen Equal really built the platform and what we call the burning platform about why is this important, why should you care, and here's the general resources. When we shifted into the afternoon, it was the Disney Institute supported content that we lend. And what was really exciting about this is once we got the green light, uh, I was able to come back with my content colleagues and ask for their help. And so the way that we approach content is that we identify uh, a pain point or a pitfall or a challenge and we come up with an insight, which is basically a business neutral truth or statement that can is portable to any environment. But what's what we do at Disney is we find an illustration within our operations across the world that, that uh, you can use as an example so people can understand what you're talking about and making the story come to life through storytelling basically. And what was so exciting is that while we had the insights around uh, care for employees and what leadership uh, can do to help motivate and create a culture of care, et cetera, we didn't have illustrations around diversity and inclusion specifically within the LGBT space. And so with this green light, we are able to create 11 new insights all around uh, both successes and candidly learnings that we had had over the last decade plus in terms of where we uh, could have improved and we have improved based on that. And last but not least, we wanted to celebrate all the successes that companies and people have had to date and not uh, to shirk that uh, area as well. So that's, it was a lot, but we compacted it. And from what we heard, uh, I'll, I'll wait for the next slide, but uh, we heard it resonated with a lot of people. Great. And then looking at that, thinking about what the success factors were and uh, how, what were the successes in, in working together and how was success measured? Perfect. Uh, this is Rod. I'll jump in on that. So when we first set up our goals for the program and what we thought success would look like, I remember Bernie and I and Rachel agreeing that if we could get 250 attendees and get a cross-section of folks from all different disciplines and all different size companies there, we would call that a success. So um, I'm actually pleased to say we had almost 700 folks representing 300 companies attend the event. They came from HR, recruitment areas, individuals interested in just uh, affirming their own knowledge or expanding that, um, nonprofits, small to large companies. Um, and I would say a lot were very interested in, and gave us feedback that things they appreciated were um, getting a deeper education around the LGBT landscape, around what compliance means, and then some of the best practices shared by the Institute in the afternoon session. Uh, we had a lot of feedback from companies subsequent to that asking us to consider bringing an event like this to their state or region. But I'll also share one other thing that I think was kind of the heart of this and the, one of the most touching um, ROIs we had at the company. In the afternoon session, uh, there was a, recent, uh, a recently um, uh, transition affirming cast member that offered to speak and, and to bring her boss, who she felt was very supportive of her transition, to the afternoon session. And Bernie, I know you're probably smiling because I remember all the scrutiny that garnered because of course, we're putting an employee of the Walt Disney Company in front of 700 people to tell their personal story. So we wanted to make sure that cast member felt that it would be a safe and welcoming environment for her to do that. And in fact, it went really well. Um, Bernie, I don't know if you wanna say anything about the content of her, of her story, just to kind of warm it up. Uh, sure. I, 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 it's so funny you said that. Uh, for those of you online, uh, Rod is in, in California, I'm in Florida, and we do not have any visual contact, but I was smiling ear to ear, so yes, <laughs> you, you got that right. It was, here's the thing, so 
um, the ca I won't use her name so she doesn't get inundated with Facebook messages and everything, but th the cast member had recently um, acknowledged to her direct reports uh, her new name and, uh, and transition affirming status only three or four weeks prior to coming here. So this was new. This was not something that could be looked back on. And um, the way that she described it to the audience, uh, it, was, it was so great. So she, to Rod's point, she brought her, her leader, her executive on there, and they talked about how they were thoughtful because one day on Friday she would leave uh, wearing her, her male name tag, and on Monday she would come in wearing her female name tag, and what that was going to look like and how to anticipate any potential challenge that she would encounter. And, and she, was, she was so clear in saying that as long as her colleagues uh, met her at a point of willingness to learn and listen, she was okay if, she made, if, if they made a mistake that was honest. She, she would be there right beside them. And I think what she said was she said, how could I not give them the benefit of the doubt? I had been uh, XYZ male name since Jimmy Carter uh, was, was in office with her coworkers. And she's like, so I'm going to work with them. But she was so pleased by what her executive said, which was basically that they spent a lot of time planning this all out, but it wasn't really necessary because the culture was so strong within the organization and within Disney that the cast, one by one, would come up to her and say, hey, tell me more about this. And it, it, was just, it was so great. And, and Rod, do you want to mention the post-after follow-up communication? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the other lessons learned, I'll just toss out there first, is, you know, having uh, a, an HR staff that is prepared and educated to be able to be supportive through the process and educate leaders and educate fellow employees where needed. And that's something that I think Parks and Resorts has done a phenomenal job with. Um, equipping their folks to be able to be a supportive and, and truly inclusive experience and environment. But here's the cool thing that happened. The event was towards the end of the week, and over the weekend on Sunday morning, George Caligridis, the president of Walt Disney World, sent our CEO, Bob Iger, an email talking about the success of the Equality Institute. Bob, as you'll remember, was one of the diversity council members who was very supportive of doing it. George simply wanted to share how well it went. George happened to mention that story because he felt that it was the moment in the afternoon where you could literally hear a pin drop at times as you were hearing this cast member tell their story. And it was very touching. And it moved our chairman so much that he asked for that cast member's email. And within a couple hours, he delivered a message to that cast member about support and inclusiveness and how proud he is of everything that that cast member taught us and also wished her the best for anything in the future. And I just want to say it because I think it was, uh, it was some of the best ROI we also got out of the event from our own employee engagement perspective. So you never know where the ROI is going to come from um, in, in doing these kinds of events. So I'm going to pass right. it off to Rachel. I'm going to jump in on this just a little bit more, which is that we got a lot of feedback from other companies that were there that said that they have, you know, someone that's transgender in their company, and they haven't known what to do, and they feel like they know what to do now. And what was really powerful for me about that was that the, the way that it was set up was really this employee talking about her experience transitioning and her manager talking about what it was like to support her. And both of those stories were not about policy. They weren't about huge cultural changes that came from you know, an HR office. It was a manager that had a moment to make a decision to support their employee, and they chose that moment. And it had a tremendous impact on this person's life, and I think that they, you know, she'll be at Disney forever. So Disney has an incredibly loyal uh, employee in her. And then it had this huge ripple effect at the event of so many companies being able to go back and say, oh, it doesn't have to be that complicated. This is just about supporting my employees, which is, which is what I do every day and what I want to keep doing. So it really was a tremendously powerful moment. And we actually have a cast member who just chatted in saying that uh, as a cast member, they're, they're emotional to hear that. So that's great to hear as well. 
Rachel, do you want to talk a little bit about how other companies might think about similar partnerships and any lessons that were learned from uh, the approach here with Disney? Yeah, you know, um, I joked about this. We did this um, same panel at Summit earlier, uh, or in late 2015, um, and I said at, at the end that I hope that we're doing another panel at Summit in 2016, and I hope it's not with our friends at Disney. Uh, because we, you know, we have a great partnership there. We want to be doing this with so many different companies around the world. Uh, what worked really well with this is that Disney had um, a program that already sort of fit something, right? They had their Veterans Institute. They'd done something like that, and it could it could pretty um, organically translate into something with an LGBT diversity and inclusion lens. And so. I'm hopeful that kind of as you hear this process, as you hear how much Disney got out of it, as you can see the impact it had um, nationwide, that you can think of a, a, a program at your company that feels like a fit that, that maybe could just add this extra lens to it and have a similar impact. And we would like to be partnering with, with you on it. So um, I think our contact information is in here somewhere. Certainly you can reach out to Daniel. But, but, but if you think of something like that, please reach out to us. Uh, I think uh, Rod maybe mentioned this, but um, Equality Institute can come to your company. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in that um, and bringing this either to your company just as an internal event, uh, we're, we're set up to do that. We'd love to be, you know, we've created this phenomenal day-long program and, and we would love to execute it more often. So uh, please reach out if you're interested in that opportunity. And if you're interested in hosting something like what Disney hosted, which was a quality institute not just for your own company, but for the region and, and companies around you, uh, please reach out too because all of those are, are big possibilities. Great. We would like to open up some time for Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments at this point, please feel free to use the chat box in your lower left-hand navigation. We do have a few that have come in as we've been on the call, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up for that. And our, our first question is, uh, is there an Equality Institute program that's coming up in the future? Well, how timely. So Rachel and I, have been in discussions uh, the last several months, actually, um, not only amongst ourselves, but with some of the attendees from the last Equality Institute who have voiced an interest. And uh, we first wanted to start with what do we think that opportunity is? And uh, both of us uh, uh, very much agree, uh, as does Bernie and our executives, that this opportunity is something we should think of globally. So. Um, we are right now in the middle of, of pitching the opportunity to some of the com companies who were interested so they understand what's involved in producing and putting on an event like this. Obviously, we have to be mindful of what needs to change about content and curriculum depending on where you host an event such as this in the world. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say that I think uh, probably within the next couple of months we'll be able to announce the uh, exact location and date for our next Equality Institute. I hope I'm not going too far out on a limb there, Rachel, to say that. No, you're, you're right. I'm right with you. Great. Anything to add to that, Rachel? Was there anything? Nope, I think you, I think you got it. Cool. Daniel, back to you. Yeah, great. So our next question is talking, if you could explain a little bit more about the content of the Equality Institute and what was presented. Bernie, do you uh, want me to start with the morning and then you can go into the afternoon? Perfect. Okay, great. So the evening before the Equality Institute, we hosted a Building Bridges training, which was uh, hosted by uh, Daniel Lauren Smith, who you all have gotten the chance to hear, which is sort of an LGBT 101 training. Uh, we wanted to make sure everyone was starting the day with the right terminology, with knowing kind of a, a base level. So we started with that. In the morning, uh, Out and Equal sort of took the lead with the content. So we had uh, different people telling their stories about what it was like, what it, what it was like to come out at work, and what their career arcs have been being out at work. Uh, we, we felt like uh, it was important before we got into, you know, all of the details of how to make this happen, that people really connected with the emotional why to make this happen. So, so we wanted to set that stage for people. So people told their stories, and then we had a panel with two um, LGBT executives at two different Fortune 500 companies uh, who were sort of a fireside chat, were in conversation about big things that came up from them, who key, key stakeholders were. They were both people that turned around companies that they were at. So they were at companies that were not doing phenomenal work on LGBT diversity and inclusion, 
they came into their company and they and it was really a 180. And so they were able to talk about what it's like to start from scratch or to turn something around. It was it was very powerful. And then we ended our morning with um, a uh, kind of state of the movement. So we talked about what, what what's going on in the LGBT equality movement nationwide. What are some big issues that are coming up? Uh, again, to, to really give people a full picture of, of the movement and what we're talking about here. And then from a Disney Institute perspective, uh, the broad themes that I would say that we tried to do, again, using the leverage of the content that we already had in place with LGBT illustrations was we showed uh, through illustrations and stories and content uh, how the Walt Disney Company has built a model of LGBT cultural inclusivity. And so this goes back to what I mentioned earlier that we actually created 11 new illustrations specifically for this event. And what was really important to our diversity and inclusion partners here in the parks and resorts is they wanted to make sure we did not come across as braggadocious or overly confident. And what I mean by that is that while we've, we've definitely achieved a lot and we're very proud of some of the accomplishments we've had, um, we're not perfect and we recognize that and we've, we've, we've had mistakes. And they wanted to make sure that we were transparent in that because otherwise what can be very daunting if you yourself are in a, an organization that's nowhere near this, uh, where do I even start? It can be overwhelming. So let me give, I guess the best way is, let me give an example. If you go back a number of years, uh, from a, a human resources and an employee or cast member benefits perspective here at Walt Disney Company, one of the most highly coveted perks or benefits is something called a main gate pass. And the main gate pass allows you and uh, your designated significant other at the time uh, and some and guests to get into our parks uh, across the country and different spots in the world. And it's a lot of fun. You get to go play in the parks and all this kind of great stuff. In an effort to be responsive to feedback from our LGBT cast members uh, a number of years ago, we allowed them, uh, which we thought was you know, advancement, to identify their domestic partner as the recipient of another main gate pass, which extended to them all the same benefits, which was, which was very progressive at the time. Here's where we messed up. Um, we required the, the cast member to identify who the other person was. And when that other person came in, if they happened to be another cast member, which is very common, we have about 74,000 cast members here in Orlando, so that likelihood was that um, more than you know, a good number uh, might be dating or in a relationship with someone that was already a cast member. And they had to walk in and say, I would like my main gate pass, and I would also like this other person's main gate pass. And the person behind the desk would say, well, what's your affiliation with them? Um, we need proof that you're supposed to get this. And in essence, we made them come out in that moment uh, completely unintentionally, even though it was the right thing that we were trying to do. So we quickly changed that, but we put that out there to say that you will, you will make mistakes. But just to go back to our cast member um, who was on stage at the Equality Institute saying, as long as it's with the right intention and you honestly are willing to learn and take feedback, uh, we found that everyone, uh, for the most part, was willing to forgive us and move forward and help us get better. That's great. And this is Daniel, and I know I, I attended the Equality Institute, and for me one of the great content pieces was hearing um, about some of the work of ESPN and all of their work uh, in the ally space, uh, both their ally commitment letter and seeing their video on that and really seeing uh, the, the support within their company in terms of uh, the role of allies and how that was very visible. So all really great stuff. Uh, a few more questions are coming in, um, and these are um, wanting to know how individuals could get in touch uh, with Disney Institute to level some, in, uh, uh, some insights, and then also uh, interest in finding out more information on the Veterans Institute. So uh, Rachel and Rod, let's, uh, we can figure this out in real time. If it's Here's my thought. If it's for Equality Institute type content um, about the Disney Institute created, I think that would go through you, Rachel, or someone at Allen Equal. Is that correct? Yep, I, I think so. And then I think all the other stuff is through Disney Institute, right? If, 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 it's, if it's pure cultural 
uh, affirmation or change, yes, that would be Disney Institute. And the best way to go through there is uh, DisneyInstitute.com is our website, and we have a link that can be general. Or if someone wants to uh, provide their contact information through the, the chat feature, uh, Daniel or Rachel, you can always pass that on to me. I can help uh, facilitate that if need be. Happy to do so, yes. Um, there, there's one more question which came in which, which I thought was a little amusing, and I, I went and quickly Googled it as we were talking here. Um, and it, 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 It's something Rod had mentioned, and that's whether braggadocious was in fact a, a Disney term. But I Googled it, and it, it's a word, Rod, so congratulations on the extensive vocabulary. Ah, was that me or Bernie? Oh, was, it, was it Bernie? Okay. <laughs> Bernie's the one with all the extensive vocabulary. That, that will definitely be my key word for the day. <laughs> Um, a question's coming in and saying uh, it would be interesting to hear if there were any barriers uh, that your teams had to overcome to move this forward and what that looked like. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, go ahead, Rod. <laughs> so my, my story is sitting down with our internal and external communications folks. And um, uh, this was about uh, five months out from the Equality Institute, it was held in July, so maybe this was like January, February timeframe. And we were just reviewing some of the concepts and directionally where we were going, et cetera. And I'll never forget it. The head of external communications looks down at the presentation I put together and says, oh wait, you wanna do this this year? And he looked like dumbfounded. And uh, the head of internal communications uh, kind of gave me a little wink and, and, and said to him, well, listen, we are trying to be a little more nimble here at the company. And uh, an old, all way of saying that typically when we do these types of events, the planning for it starts sometimes two years out or longer. So, um, but the fact was, this was a burning platform. It was uh, about equality in the workplace. And you guys remember there was so much happening around this issue and around marriage at the time that it was very relevant and we had to take advantage or felt like we had to take advantage of the overall kind of increased attention to present a program like this. So I would just say that was one of the roadblocks we, we did have to overcome was making sure our key stakeholders internal who are just trying to make sure that we all present the best Disney we can felt comfortable that we were kind of jumping ahead, so to speak, in terms of a shortened timeline to put together everything. Great. And then we just, just have a comment here, and uh, earlier you had mentioned the importance of not doing all of your collaboration through email, but instead having face-to-face -face conversations. And John is just saying that that's really important because that aspect leads to telling stories and making it more personal within that professional environment. So just back up for, for that notion there. So with that, I'd like to turn it over back to the team to talk about uh, next steps and any closing comments that you might have. Sure. Can I just make one, one comment? Um, someone just wrote in a question, um, did we receive any feedback that the registration fee was prohibitive for some? So I just want to clarify that there was no registration fee. The conference itself was offered complimentary, and that was very purposefully done. Um, because we had talked about maybe just collecting a minimal fee because you know if, if you have to pay a little bit, you tend to show up and we wanted to make sure we didn't have a lot of attrition. But at the end of the day, we felt it was the right thing to do to position this as an event that the only out-of-pocket people had was if they needed to travel or if they needed an overnight stay. Great point, a really great uh, resource for all of the attendees with that. So thank you for sharing. And Daniel, I see you are, you're on next steps. So is that something that you might be able to reference in the webinar right now or the, the, the tips and tricks, or is that something that uh, I should reference in terms of the email that they re will receive and have? Yes, yeah, so within the trips, uh, tips and tricks document, what we can do is include that in the email follow-up, which will go out after the session. So that will include the recording link as well as that document. And, and for everyone uh, online, just so you know, uh, one of the things that we found at Disney Institute is if you can encapsulate some key learnings from the talk and next steps, 
uh, we found that that's helpful. So we created a, a two-page handout in, in partnership with Out Equal that talks about the first 10 steps. So when you get back uh, to your organization and you think about where do you start, how do you do it, it helps guide maybe the first 10 steps that might uh, get you on that journey. And then the flip side is it really just reinforces what you've seen on the slides in terms of what are the areas of focus in terms of diversity and inclusion for, for the Walt Disney Company, what was our journey like, and why it's important to build and how to build that burning case. So that would be my, my offering to you if it's helpful. Uh, I, I wish you uh, good luck and speed on that. Uh, and then I would, I would encourage and reiterate what Rachel had mentioned earlier. If you find an appetite within your organization to in some way partner with Out and Equal, uh, I, I would encourage it wholeheartedly. This particular project the Equality Institute was in addition to my day job running our professional development courses. This this was not on anyone's radar within my department or organization, and so uh, it was a, it was a labor of love, which uh, was absolutely fantastic. But one of the benefits personally to me was beyond growing my own uh, network and knowledge. The, uh, to something that John had mentioned in one of the comments, the, the network within the company. So Disney is a really big organization, and I'm sure many of you work at large organizations too. I had uh, the opportunity, and I, I, I needed to go meet with individuals that I would have never met with before. So the fact that Rod and I are kind of, you know, teasing and back and forth here, I don't think that would have ever happened without this, and uh, it's, it's just been truly uh, fun and uh, growth opportunity for me. Rachel? Thank you so much for saying that, Bernie. And, and that's our hope, too, is that people, um, that the, the corporation is benefiting, that the, the movement is benefiting, and that uh, the individual leaders that we're working with are benefiting. So I'm, I'm really delighted to hear that. You know, we hope that you'll reach out uh, to talk more about partnerships and, and how we can be building this and taking, taking the Equality Institute to you, but also uh, creating new external programs that, that can really be part of your you know, global diversity and inclusion flagship, uh, and, and also uh, spreading this really important mission of LGBT workplace equality. Great. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you, Bernie, Rod, and Rachel, for sharing your time and your insights today, not only in making this presentation possible, both through our virtual summit and at the 2015 Out and Equal Workplace Summit, but for all the many efforts that went behind making the Equality Institute uh, a possibility, and very excited to see how this is going to continue to move forward. We also want to thank each and every one of you on the line with us today for your time and commitment. A reminder that this call will be recorded and available as a digital archive afterward, and along with that, we're going to include uh, that tips and tricks handout. A reminder that the 2016 Out and Equal Workplace Summit will be October 4th through 7th with our good friends at the Walt Disney Company at the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Resort in Orlando, Florida. So we hope that you will join us and 3,000 other LGBT and ally professionals. There will be a brief survey at the end of the call, and your feedback is important to us, so please take a moment to fill that out and let us know your thoughts. A reminder that our next monthly town call will be on March 31st at 12 p.m. Pacific. It will be Go Global, adapting your ERG to accommodate growth and success. Our entire virtual summit series is available online at www.outandequal.org under Resources and University. And if you would like any information about training opportunities, please feel free to reach out to Pat Bailey, Director of Training, or myself, Daniel Lawrence Smith, Associate Director of Training. On behalf of Out and Equal, we hope that you have a great day, and thank you so much for joining us.